Hi everyone, I'm Natalie from My Progression and you're watching part one of three on safeguarding. This video will take you through what is safeguarding, why do we need it, and your legal responsibility. What is safeguarding? Every child has the right to flourish, safe from harm and abuse. As educational professionals, we strive to keep our children safe and healthy. And every school has a range of policies to allow all staff to do this. With this in mind, we've designed this training to help you understand the good practice of how to safeguard children and yourself. It's so important that everyone in the school knows what to look out for, how to respond to disclosures and how to report any concerns. If you go into a school as a supply staff, do you have the same safeguarding responsibilities as permanent staff? Yes, you absolutely do but your challenge can be greater. You need to get to grips with the policies and procedures in every school you visit. It's your responsibility to make sure you keep up to date with safeguarding and child protection legislations and always act on concerns. All schools you work in should, by law, have safeguarding policies and procedures to ensure that every single child, regardless of their age, disability, gender, race, religion or belief, sex or sexual orientation, has a right to equal protection from harm. Every school will have a designated safeguarding officer, a DSO or DSP. In primary schools, it's often the head teacher who has this role. Many schools will ask you to read and sign a safeguarding policy. Some will give you a badge to wear with a summary of the policy on it, and often you'll see posters displayed. The school should make it clear to all visitors, but for your own sake, if it's not obvious when you arrive at the school, make it a priority to find out about their policy on safeguarding and who the DSO is. Let's start by clarifying what we mean by safeguarding. Safeguarding is the action that's taken to promote the welfare of children and protect them from harm. It means protecting children from abuse and maltreatment, preventing harm to children's health or development, ensuring children grow up with the provision of safe and effective care, and finally, taking action to enable all children and young people have the best outcomes. Child protection is part of the safeguarding process. It focuses on protecting individual children identified as suffering or likely to suffer significant harm. This includes child protection procedures, which tells us how to respond to concerns about a child. Why do we need to safeguard? Well, let's look back to February 2000. Victoria Columbier, aged eight, was tortured and murdered by her great aunt and her great aunt's boyfriend. Her death led to a public inquiry and produced major changes in child protection policies in the UK. During the abuse, Victoria was burnt with cigarettes, tied up for periods of longer than 24 hours and hit with bite chains, hammers and wires. Up to her death, the police, the social services department of four local authorities, the National Health Service, the NSPCC and local churches all had contact with her and noted the signs of abuse. However, in what the judge in the trial following Victoria's death described as blinding incompetence, they all failed to properly investigate the case and little action was taken. The great aunt and her boyfriend were convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. The inquiry uncovered that child protection staff missed at least 12 chances to save Victoria. Lord Laming's final report published in January 2003 concluded that the child protection system failed as a result of a lack of basic good practice by frontline staff and most significantly senior managers failing to take responsibility for the failings of their organisations. The report made 108 recommendations and as a direct result the government published its plans in 2003 in the Green Paper, Every Child Matters. 
This was followed by the Children's Act 2004, which allows the creation of a national child database made up of local information hubs in 150 local authorities. Undoubtedly, the Victoria Columbia case is beyond comprehension for most people, tragic and unimaginable. However, child abuse is more common than some think. We don't know how many children are being abused because not all abuse is reported. But the most recent data tells us that in one year, Childline delivered nearly 20,000 counselling sessions to children in the UK where abuse was the primary concern. Around 1 in 20 of the sessions resulted in a referral to external agencies. In that same year, over 55,000 children were looked after by their local authority because of experience or risk of abuse or neglect. One in five adults reported they experienced at least one form of child abuse before the age of 16. That's 8.5 million people in the UK. Many victims of child abuse remain hidden. It's reported that one in seven adults who called a helpline in the latest year had not told anyone about their abuse before. So it still remains a huge concern and we must remember that many, many children will and always will suffer in silence. As teaching professionals, we therefore need to be alert to this and act when we can to help all our children. Legal responsibility. In addition to our moral responsibility to protect our children, we have a legal responsibility to ensure all of our children's rights are upheld. I'll assume you already know this, but let's take some time to revisit the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child, the UNCRC. It's a legally binding international agreement setting out the civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights of every child, regardless of their race, religion or abilities. The UNCRC consists of 54 articles that set out children's rights and how governments should work together to make them available to all children. Under the terms of the convention, governments are required to meet children's basic needs and help them reach their full potential. Central to this is the acknowledgement that every child has basic fundamental rights. These include the right to life, survival and development, to protection from violence, abuse or neglect, to an education that enables children to fulfil their potential, to be raised by or have a relationship with their parents and to express their opinions and be listened to. If you don't safeguard and protect the children in your care, you're breaching the terms of the convention. You are the government's representative. To continue learning about safeguarding, head over to video two, which will take you through what signs you need to look out for. I've been Natalie from My Progression, and if you found this introduction to safeguarding useful, then have a look at the other videos on working in education, and let's keep your career in motion.